Welcome everyone today to Clean Starts Perspective. Um, I'm excited. We're back with a couple of these and, you know, they're always great discussions. So um, Clean Start Perspectives are sponsored by SMUD, Blue Tech Valley, River City Bank, and the California Mobility Center. And I'd like to welcome our guests, Blake Stenden and Bob so Zubzak, <laughs> uh, Senior Director of Sales. And I'm going to let them take over and give us a, an introduction to Brainbox AI. And we'll, have a, and then we'll talk. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, really, really appreciate your participation. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Blake Stanton is going to be leading the discussions today. Uh, Blake, I'm going to hand it over to you. Well, thanks for having us today, everyone. Um, the presentation is is a little bit long, so I might skip over some things. I might talk fast because um, I really want to get to our question and answer session. Um, where we can get into the details and, and uh, you know, really open up the hood, uh, if you will. Um, so a little bit about myself, and I'll let Bob introduce himself too, is that uh, I head up our technical sales division at uh, Brainbox for the World, and we are, we are a global uh, company uh, with installations all around the world. I'll talk a little bit about that. I spent half my career in the energy efficiency consulting world with utilities, in evaluation firms, did a lot of work for California CPUC um, and others down there. Um, and then uh, halfway through my career, I moved into the, the contractor or commercial sector, let's call it. Uh, so I worked for companies like Train um, before I worked at Brainbox leading analytical and, and project development work uh, for energy efficiency and new, like, let's call it software technologies. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. Bob, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Um, my name is Bob Sochik, and I'm the Senior Director of Sales for uh, Brainbox. I've been with them uh, since November of last year, so relatively new to the organization. I uh, find it extremely exciting. Uh, this is a place that I, I've been in, in energy management and energy conservation and decarbonization uh, solutions, software solutions, mostly SaaS-type solutions, uh, for over uh, again, nine to 10 years. And this is, this is the most exciting uh, space I've ever been in, so very happy to be part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key when, when we go through this presentation is, is is remembering that what we're doing today at Brainbox is quite a bit more advanced than, than it has been done in the industry before. And therefore, there are challenges, as you can imagine, but uh, it's fun work to, to be in. Um, a little bit about the company. Um, it was founded in 2017. Uh, we went commercial in, in, in 2019 in May. I started in 2020. Um, so I've been with the company for, for a couple of years now. Um, it is um, headquarters in Montreal, and one of the big reasons why it is headquartered in Montreal, other than our founders live in Montreal, um, there are universities that are strictly pumping out, you know, AI graduates left and right, and some of the top leaders in the AI industry live and, and work in those universities, and so it's a hotbed for uh, talent for us uh, in the AI world. Um, we are deployed across the world, over 400 buildings. Um, we work with research partners like NREL um, and, and others around the world um, to you know, collaborate on AI technologies in the built environment space. Um, I, when I started, we were 40 people. Uh, now we're over 150 people uh, kind of scattered throughout the world, mostly in Montreal. So a uh, little bit about our footprint. So we went to market first in North America. Um, our second uh, market we established was Australia, um, and as we are growing across the world, we're seeing a significant increase in the Middle East in deployments um, as they consume a lot of energy, as you can imagine, um, and Europe um, is a big focus for us in 2023. I was just out there uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to push um, quite a bit market uh, penetration in that area as prices skyrocket for energy costs, as you can imagine due to the war uh, with Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, uh, so some of our awards that we've gotten, I won't talk through all of these, but we were in, uh, in 2021, I think time's best invention uh, for the green sector space. Um, we have quite a few trusted advisors and uh, trusted uh, partners. So one of our lead investors in 2021 was ABB. Um, and they are a strategic partner of ours. We're going to market with them as well through their, um, you know, through their channels and, and, and customers as well. KMC is another one. 
Um, our big customers that we've deployed recently is Sleep Country across their, their portfolio um, and AMP Capital in, in Australia. So really, realistically, what can what does BrainBox do at a high level? Uh, we are impacting and reducing the carbon footprint of the built environment. So anything from a retail environment to a commercial office building to a mall, um, mo most building use types are applicable uh, for our technology. But our goal is to reduce the carbon emissions from those buildings. So scope one and scope two emissions um, in those buildings. Um, most of that comes from reducing the HVAC energy costs and energy consumption. So up to 25% we're seeing, and that's going to vary per property type and per building and per opportunity. Um, and the big one though, for tenant driven or uh, leased property spaces is an increase in comfort. So this is pretty important in the built environment space, making sure that we're providing comfort in the built environment space uh, when it gets hot or cold outside. Um, using our technology, we do see a reduction in, in HVAC uh, or an increase in HVAC life expectancy from the equipment itself. Uh, this is due to running it less um, and optimizing its performance. So I'm going to touch this really quickly because it's not an AI chat, but realistically thinking about how we're applying technology uh, and AI technology into the industry is that you have to kind of understand there are multiple levels of, of AI technologies. Uh, there's machine learning, there's deep learning, there's neural networks, there's there's quite a bit of different technologies. But what Brainbox is utilizing is, is this time series neural network that other industries have used for other you know, uh, processes. So chatbots, um, the new one is ChatGPT, uh, uses the same technology that we're using. Um, translation application and voice recognition is all time series and predicting what you're going to say or predicting what you're going to do. And that's the function of this AI technology. Um, so as we deploy our technology or we're, we're thinking about deploying, we're like, hey, why don't we turn a building into more of a self-predicting preemptive machine, let's call it like a self-driving car per se, or you know, these chatbots that are predicting what you're asking or what you want to, to learn from their, from the ask. And so we can use that technology in the built environment because most of the time today, any building is reacting to its instant in time, what's happening around it. It has no visibility into the future and how to optimize it more efficiently in the future. So quick challenges for commercial market, you know, 45% of the energy from um, the commercial building energy consumption comes from HVAC, so almost half on a typical building. Uh, so many studies have said that um, you know 30 percent or even more of that energy is wasted because the system's not optimized. It doesn't have an AI uh, like let's engine or AI agent on top of it, making sure it's efficient all the time, um, and so on. One thing that I will note for this group too is is pretty important is that the the innovations in the HVAC commercial space is pretty much non-existent. There are some startups coming around trying to, to change the space, but it's highly profitable from the large manufacturers um, and they dominate the market. So innovation is kind of ripe for this space. As you can see, a lot of startups are coming, starting up now. Brainbox is a little bit ahead of the game because we've been um, uh, to market for, for a couple of years now. So real, real, the problem is, and we'll kind of skip the next couple of slides, is that current HVAC control systems have limited power, um, processing power. They don't have other data streams outside of the building. Uh, they need to be commissioned and recommissioned and continuously commissioned all the time um, because they get drift and there's human error that override things and so on. Um, and so using an AI preemptive DDC control or an AI agent on top of the existing infrastructure can allow the system to optimize um, its full ability using the power of the cloud, the processing power, um, you know, using other API data streams like weather forecast. Your current building automation system doesn't even have weather forecast in it, which boggles my mind. Uh, energy costs and time of use costs and occupancy data when available and so on. So you can utilize a lot of other data sources to make better decisions in your building. 
So we do predict what's going to happen in every single zone by using all of our data sources from APIs to the existing building system. What we're doing with that is we're predicting every single zone in a building, two to six hours, maybe longer, uh, what's going to happen. And we're using that information to modify the control sequences automatically, you know, without human intervention. And so we're writing back to the control system continuously. Um, looking through this um, kind of uh, circle is that I mentioned the learning function of it. So we're learning what's happening. We're predicting what's going to happen. We're making sure to compare our prediction and generate it over 95% accuracy on our predictions. Once we hit that level in a building, and that could be a week, it could be a couple couple weeks, or maybe even a month or two, um, we're acting on that information automatically every five minutes, uh, 365 um, days a year. So think of this as an AI agent, you know, constantly learning, constantly optimizing the built the building's HVAC system, ongoing forever. So results quickly, 26% um, reduction for this client across their portfolio. We are a technology only like software driven, like a platform. So realistically, we don't have any hardware that we want to install. Um, it's all software driven. So we can scale across large portfolios across the world um, if we need to. So this is an example. Uh, this was another example, 21% uh, reduction on this one. Um, this is a large commercial building. Um, we saw 29. So it varies per, per site and, and per project, but we have plenty of case studies on our website if you want to look at some of the other use cases we have. Um, all of these systems have different HVAC systems. Um, and so we have uh, technology that can deploy on multiple different system types um, as we go through. We do have a client dashboard that we share and show results on. So these are going to be how much should you save me? Um, reduction in energy and scope one and scope two emissions, uh, so on. A couple integration strategies, like I mentioned. So um, these are all existing infrastructures we're hoping for. If we don't have an existing infrastructure, we can deploy a gateway. Um, but our preferred method is to utilize existing infrastructure to connect with. Um, and we just have to figure that out early on in the process. Um, like I mentioned, we are going through mapping and learning early on. So we're understanding the thermodynamic nature of the building. Then we're going to optimize it in real time without human intervention. Um, so the AI is going to start sending commands back to the control system to optimize it. And then we're continuously improving. We are a SaaS-based model. Uh, so we are uh, adding more capabilities as we go, more data sources from APIs, from, from, from other things that pop up, like real-time grid emissions data, uh, and so on like that. We also do have a monitoring service. So if we are controlling HVAC systems um, from the cloud, we need to monitor our control and our connection to those buildings. And so we do have a 24-7 monitoring team. Uh, it's dedicated to troubleshoot things, uh, making sure we're getting data in that is accurate, uh, and we're making sure that we're applying control strategies that are actually optimizing and useful. So one of the big things that I know Thomas wanted to mention is kind of the near future for Brainbox technology is that we want to marry and merge and in other industries and other you know companies out there are trying to do this is that they're trying to take the what's the infrastructure and the built environment, bind it with the grid infrastructure and really balance the grid and the buildings usage. You know, California is a big example of you know the the brownouts and the blackouts possibilities. They've deployed virtual power plants before, mostly on the residential sector, uh, using smart thermostats. Um, and so once when we are attacking the commercial industry, there's not a standardized approach across the commercial industry to build virtual power plants. And so with our technology, since it can lay over many different building automation system types, connection, we're trying to establish that grid level optimization uh, possibility. And we're doing a couple pilots with a couple of partners in, in other parts of the world uh, to make sure that this is optimized at the grid level. And when you do that, you know, you can obviously program something to react to grid changes, but our approach is really something different. It's looking at 
using the AI agents to start learning that they're next to other AI agents and they can optimize and work together on their own uh, to you know what we need from the grid level approach. So um, you can manage buildings at the grid level or in a pod of, of uh, buildings to maybe load shed or load shift or pre-cool or utilize the building as a thermal battery per se. And all of these are, are things that the agent, the AI agents can do together if we if we allow them to. I went through really fast and I apologize, uh, but uh, I wanted to get to question and answers from everybody. Um, so I'll kind of open up the floor. All right. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. I know I've got a few questions. I know Gary will have some too. I'm gonna quickly make um, add people to the spotlight here. But I'm my kind of first question on is you talk you showed all you know a lot of these buildings that are having these great benefits and reduction and things. Um, how are a lot of these buildings they're owned and operated by one person and or occupied by one group? Is there is there something if I'm a you know a developer and I have a property or a campus that has you know several different group um, companies occupying it? Um, how, how do you guys kind of handle that? Is that something where you'd say well, approach the campus to get them to install everything? Or is it you got to go individual to the businesses to try to get them to do that upgrade? That's, that's a great question, Thomas. And, and I'll start and maybe Bob can, can finish it. But uh, we're doing both at the moment. So um, we are seeing a big uh, sustainability effort in the, let's call it the retail market. So one owner for thousands of buildings per se. Um, and we are seeing a, a growth strategy in that area. Uh, it's one of Bob's focus in, in this one owner, multiple properties buildings. We're also seeing the the other way too, is that, you know, individual building, you know, say tenants um, are starting to trying to report on their and uh, uh, scope to emissions for reporting metrics. And they need to understand what they're consuming at that local level too. So they are reaching out and we are installing and working with, with those single, let's call them single building um, installations. Um, but also in, in your example from, a, from let's say campus level or developer, maybe an owner that owns multiple different property types. Um, we are working with the large scale REITs um, to you know, look at their portfolios and find and choose the buildings that work best for our technology to optimize it. So we're kind of going in all different directions, if that answers your question. Anything to buy? Anything to add, Bob? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned scope and missions, uh, control and, and decarbonization. A lot of the retail customers that I'm speaking with now have those kinds of objectives, especially I, I, would, I would submit you know, some of the more progressive ones, right? And um, I will also add, just as a little bit of a commercial, that um, one of the largest retailers in the world is, uh, is rolling out of the system right now. I'm not uh, obliged to be able to share their name just yet, but I, I'm sure you all would recognize them. We've got quite a quite a bit of momentum going on with that too. So thank you. Well, that'll be a big win for um, you guys on that. Now, where, where do you see these companies getting a lot of pressure to change? Is it, uh, I think I, I'd hope that it would be kind of the cost savings potentially on it, but is it, um, is it, you know, more of a pre pressure from an ESG or a, you know, a ratings um, group or something like that? What's making them say like, okay, I want to change? Because I feel like a lot of them, you know, this is a cost they just passed on to the tenants. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And so it's coming from different directions, I would say. So individual tenants are wanting to know what their, their landlord is doing to reduce their emissions because they have emission goals, like I mentioned earlier. Um, the other thing is that it's still from an owner perspective or, or cost perspective, it's still you know mostly cost driven. Uh, I wanna reduce my cost, my OPEX in my buildings. Um, even if I pass those down to my tenants, my tenants are asking us to reduce our OPEX as well. And so that's, a, that's still a big driver, but what Bob mentioned from a large like companies that are starting to report it to the SEC and so on is that they have this new bucket of money from an GHG, a, a greenhouse gas emission reduction, and they have goals to, to get to net zero or whatever at a certain time period, is that now that they have fun, they need to fund technology that can scale fast. Um, and so we're seeing some, some pressure from, from executive levels to push down 
Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I just wanted to address a couple of the questions that popped up in chat. <clears throat> uh, the first one, somebody, Mark, I guess you had asked about moving into the uh, residential small commercial space. Um, I guess I'd qualify that, you know, considering that this is an AI system that that is managing lots of aspects of, of the building. There's minimum that that we can affect in a uh, in say residential uh, environment, uh, perhaps a larger apartment complex, something like that, which would be part of our our commercial uh, offering. Um, and then um, uh, Franklin, you had you asked a question about the benefit to the life of the HVAC equipment. Absolutely, you know, in soft savings, Blake mentioned you know uh, customer comfort or, or occupancy comfort uh, as well. Uh, we we attribute to the extension of the benefit of, of uh, all. Uh, HVAC equipment life uh, by um, maximizing the efficiency of the operation of the equipment, uh, which which has a, a natural extension to its life. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that that leads kind of into the next thing. I kind of want to get a feedback from you guys on. So you you have the problem that you guys kind of have identified of cost, comfort, um, pressure from. Uh, different groups to report on emissions and, you know, kind of get more in line with that. And then you guys have your solution or the value proposition of your um, brain box AI saying, okay, we can help with that and solve additional things to it. Um, and, you know, the channels of going out to them. What I kind of want to know is, so you, 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 you came up with this, you know, value proposition to solve someone's problems. And then entrepreneurs often then go into, um, okay, how do I get someone to help me fundraise or do this? And then there's, you know, all these sort of barriers. You guys had six, um, some success with ABB, which is one of, you know, is a very large company in the electrical space um, and getting, you know, support from them and investment from them. And I know you're still, I think, on the fundraising trail, but um, what were some keys to being able to take, you know, this, this idea that you had of Brainbox AI that you're starting to get into some space and getting some traction with, and then going to a group like ABB and saying, you know, you should take us a little bit more seriously. Yeah. I mean, one of the big things when I first started Thomas is that we, we put our money where our mouth is early on is that we, we started telling customers that let us prove it to you that we can provide value um across the board and so we've done that in many different use types and we use that prove it mentality for our investors as well so a lot of our investors actually have um brainbox ai running on one of their properties like abb does as well mm -hmm. so um that was part of our strategy as well and the other strategy too like especially from the abb's perspective is they have huge esg goals and they don't know how to do that and they are also looking at their scope three emission goals that's and that's their vendors and, and their suppliers and so on and so they wanted to also put their money where their mouth is and say hey we are investing in technologies to drive decarbonization across not only our portfolio but offered around to our clients as well and that's been a big um i would say big item the last year or two from these large-scale organizations and in our investment um conversations. Bob, do you have anything to add to that one? Um, not really. I guess I wanted to come back to the decarbonization because we didn't really, um, I think, make it clear that we're also measuring uh, that scope emissions in scope one and two and be able to report back to those ESG uh, summaries as well. Obviously, scope three, we can't check suppliers, but we can at least see what, what, what's, what's within the confines of the facility that we're managing. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of an ancillary offering that we're providing to you know thomas is that it, we want to reduce the consumption in the building but many customers need to know how to report it and measure it and so if we're already reducing it we already essentially have to measure our reduction and therefore measuring you know prior to our reduction is not a big ask um and so we've added that capability you know you know doing paperwork is what gets you in the door to reducing emissions and saving costs you know I think that's that's a huge one. And I think, um, you know, ABB is a public company. So if you're a startup out there, you know, go look at the public companies that might be in your area and see what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. And you could probably make a wager that, you know, companies that aren't public that are similar size or something smaller are thinking the same thing that are competing with them. Um, so I think that's a, like a really good uh, point on what, you know, their their drivers on it are on it. Um, now, I, I really like that you highlighted, I guess, the virtual power plants and I guess interacting with tariffs on it. 
Um, Sunrun, which you mentioned more as the residential side, they're they're planning some big virtual power plant sort of things. Um, have you guys, uh, I guess, been approached or been incorporated into any virtual power plants or, um, I guess, tariff schemes that are the equivalent of one? I yeah, for sure. So we're doing a couple of tests with a couple of entities. I can't talk about them uh, publicly, but um, that's our, our our plan for this summer. So we're building the capability out now, and then we're testing and we're proving it out to these clients uh, this summer so that it could be product productized next year, hopefully, is the goal. Um, and so it will be working with the large-scale uh, ISO grids um and uh, making sure that they you know work with us to build these mini virtual power plants we however we still need to get into the buildings themselves as well so there's still a pretty big commercial push to to focus on those areas of growth in those different isos that care about it getting into those buildings you know with a lot of i guess just the general aging buildings around you know in pretty much every state um are you and you guys being mostly a software sort of, you know, or a software play, you said, you know, you guys don't do hardware. Um, is there, is that a big barrier to you guys? Um, are you stage of the building? It, it can be Thomas. I, so, you know, when I started at Brainbox, there was one, there are two sales engineers. It was me and a colleague. Um, and our job was to assess the built environment to see hey, if we can connect to, we could provide value to this building itself. Um, and so during the last couple of years, we've highly invested in a sales engineering team across the world to take the burden away from our customers to figure this out. It's like, we just want a little bit of information. We'll tell you if this building is compatible with our technology and what kind of value we can provide to you in a fairly quick manner uh, using our robust team. So that's been a big investment over the last couple of years um, because every building is unique. They're not manufactured like cars. Um, even in the retail space, you know, they're supposed to be cookie cutters, but there are differences because they're in different climates, different codes, different construction methodologies. So um, we have to look at them kind of uniquely, uh, but we built the capability and the team and the uh, efficiencies to, to scale that across the world. Though. And maybe I could just touch on the process, too. I think it's relevant to what you were just talking about. First off, um, when when we went through the earlier part of the the, uh, the presentation, we are definitely a, a software focused company. Mm -hmm. However, in buildings where there is no uh, management controls existing, we do have a smart thermostat that we can add in so that we can at least get the data. Right, we need a control a control that. Uh, so the process that we follow, it, as uh, Blake kind of touched on, is we'll we'll process what's called a scout report. It's basically a paper study of a selection of buildings, but hopefully across a, a, a multiple geographer, uh, geographic locations so that we can get a good sampling. And from that, we can estimate what the savings would be and process that back to the customer. At that point, we try to do a pilot. And at that point, hopefully we'll do an implementation. Yeah, and it's really, you know, understanding the ROI of the project as well. So that's part of our, our job early on is to say, hey, this is, you know, this is what our value could be. This is what it's going to cost. Is this worth it to you? Um, and what's your ROI um, threshold, essentially? So, it's, uh, so it sounds also like you guys have decided to go with kind of, I guess, the internal sales approach. Um, now, I know there's a lot of, uh, I guess, smaller, uh, I don't know how you describe the different levels of HVAC engineers and environmental control engineers that are, you know, that do a lot of stuff all around the country. Are you guys thinking that you're going to be doing direct kind of in uh, sales to large platforms or are you at all looking at like, hey, here's something we can add to um, someone else's existing service portfolio when they go out? Exactly. So we have three go to market strategies right now. You mentioned the first one. Obviously, we're going direct to customers and Bob does a lot of that and some of our other sales engineers. We also have a secondary market. It's called a channel sales. And so we are selling directly to the large system integrators that, you know, work on control systems and they sell control systems, they design and build them, so on. And so they are reselling our technology to their customer bases as well. Um, and the third one, like ABB and others, is really selling uh, to an OEM or a large global entity for them to take it to their customers. Um, and so those are kind of our three approaches uh, today. Uh, Bob, do you have anything to add to that one? No, nope, I think you covered that one pretty well. Gary, you've been unusually quiet. And you're muted. And you're muted. 
you've got a lot of information here. Let me let me just ask a few more things. You, you just talked about ROI payback period. What typically are you showing when a customer says, you know, what's my ROI? Bob, you want that one? I sure, can... I can take that one. So it's it's an, it's an it depends, obviously, you know. But during the scout report phase, we're able to estimate a, ca a positive cash flow in a matter of months. And um, that's dependent of, um, on whether we're, we're integrating to an existing system where the, the uh, cash flow positive is going to be much sooner, or if we have to incorporate some of those smart thermostats I was talking about, where there may be a CapEx element to it that has to, to be depreciated or included into that, um, into that cash flow positive phase. Make sense? Makes sense. And, and what's your communication architecture? Are you using public Wi-Fi with some kind of uh, cybersecurity on it, or do you have your own network? Uh, how do you do the communication with all the devices? Definitely. So there are a couple different flavors. Um, we we have the ability to install a, uh, a cellular modem on site um, that uses a, a, a 4G connection through an, a private APN network. So it's not over the internet. So think of a, um, uh, an ATM, how it communicates to the cloud. That's the same technology, so highly secure. Um, however, a lot of large scale organizations and customers have their their own IT policies and they want to flow traffic through their firewalls and through their networks. And so we have the ability to use that route as well. Um, and, you know, those are pretty much our two primary connection methods. Um, our goal is not to install hardware, as, as we've mentioned before. Um, so if they're willing to utilize their own Internet um, and secure the traffic, then then we'll go that way. All right. And. You mentioned you've got 65 million square feet uh, uh, in, in what you're servicing right now in North America. Um, our local utility, SMUD, has a goal to become uh, zero carbon uh, by 2035. And of course, the building sector is a huge part of being able to reduce carbon emissions. And, and meet 2030. Yeah. 2030. Yeah. Um, uh, are you active in Sacramento? Do you have buildings under management here? Bob, I'll pass it on to you. Not yet, but I'd love to talk with you about it. Well, I think that would be a good discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and to your point, Gary, I think, uh, you know, our, our company is based on the East Coast in Montreal, so our growth has naturally been over there um, as we move in. But Bob's a recent addition that lives in California. I'm, I'm also on the West Coast as well. And so our goal is to start uh, tackling the market uh, out here, especially in California, as prices are pretty uh, extreme from a cost perspective. And we have, you know, a push for uh, decarbonization on the West Coast that's more than the, let's say, Midwest and, and so on. So uh, we see a market growth strategy out here um, happening very quickly. And so, 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 Bob, where are you based in California? Just a little up the hill from you in Cameron Park. First year popping your way to South Lake. You're local. Oh. You're local. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you might re uh, recognize Bob from um, when we had our discussion with Legend Power. Oh, sure. That's why you, so he's, yeah, he's, he's always uh, helping with those innovative technologies around buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, and that's, that's part of it. We needed boots on the ground, Gary, you know, uh, to, to help uh, educate the market. So that I'm glad Bob joined the team. Yeah, well, that, that's really something. So you, you might even have some snow in your backyard, Bob. It might melt soon, but. Yeah. It was getting down there to your elevation. Yeah, it was. Um, so one of the things in a building um, and, a, and a high cost item, uh, maintenance. And you've got a lot of motors. Um, you've got a lot of bearings. And uh, there's a value that building owners really put on preventive maintenance, but no mm -hmm. good way to do it. Yep. Preventive maintenance is usually a matter of monitoring vibrations and seeing when they, they get outside a normal range that you're, you're predicting a bearing failure and taking care of it before it destroys the equipment is always a good idea. I know you said you, you weren't into, at this point, adding equipment, but as a growth area, are you looking at preventive maintenance and, and monitoring vibration uh, as, a, as an add-on? Because in our experience in talking with other companies, that's a fairly high value service that building owners recognize. You, you're asking all the good questions, Gary. So a lot of our largest customers right now are asking for that capability. And so we're currently building it out for them specifically. Um, at, as you can imagine, we are monitoring and pulling in extreme amounts of data from the, build, from the building. 
um, and can we utilize AI technologies to detect what you what you're mentioning? Maybe not from a vibration perspective, but maybe from an equipment possible failure perspective. Um, and so we're building those out right now, um, and it's part of it's going to be part of our service offering. I would say pretty soon. Um, it's just defining what level and how deep we want to go. And talking with my my uh, CFO yesterday, we we still don't want to get into the equipment. But we want to be able to provide the information for our strategic partners like ABBs or others that we're working with. Here's the information for you to go sell the hardware and go and go help your customers. And that's kind of our our, our goal and our growth strategy there. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation in getting sensors smaller, cheaper, and uh, lower power. Yeah. But yet being able to monitor vibration and temperature gives building owners a lot of insight as to how their equipment is uh, performing and how close it is to failure. Yeah, one, one of the big uh, initiatives we're doing right now in testing is utilizing some wireless technologies to add sensors uh, for, for this very thing, Gary. And there's some, some companies out there that are you know, making these sensors smaller and they're, they're battery powered and they have you know, secure Wi-Fi networks or, or whatever network they may use. Um, and so we're experimenting, being able to bring that as part of the solution as well. Well, that, that's really good to hear. I, I, I think you'll find that to be a, a rewarding area to get into. Yeah. Um, we mentioned fundraising only briefly. Where where are you in terms of of your growth strategy and being able to raise the money to to grow quickly? Usually, that's a that's an obstacle because you're you're having to invest in things long before the the uh, uh, the cash flow yep. uh, supports that. Yep. Like uh, Thomas mentioned, we, we had finished our Series A round uh, about a year and a half ago that funded, uh, uh, I want to say it was a little over $20 million, um, for our growth strategy. Uh, we're currently going through another round. I don't know if it's going to be Series A or, or how it's going to close, uh, but we are looking for investors. Um, we're pretty late stage, so I'm not sure if we're looking for new ones, but um, we are working with quite a few investors to, to, to fund the next phase of our evolution. Um, we have we have very big goals to impact uh, our use our technology across the world. And as you can imagine, we have to make sure that we can scale across that world as well. Absolutely. So I noticed that that uh, Franklin Burris, he's one of our partners from SMUD, our local utility, uh, asked a question. So he, his question is, what's your highest value user? An office, a multifamily, condition warehouse? I'll throw in server farms. Well, where where do you find the lowest hanging fruit? I can I can take that if you like, Blake. Go go for it, Bob. So sort of like, who's your what, what's your favorite um, um what's your favorite child? You know, it's it's a little <laughs> difficult to answer, right? Um, I will I will say though that that where we we do shy away. You mentioned server farms, and I'll also offer in um you know critical <laughs> systems. You know, we're in a hospital or something like that, where we really try to shy away from that just because of the you know the implications that the you know, liabilities. Yeah. Right. But um, you know, I'm focused primarily on multi-site retail, and we find that to be a, a very high value um, user at this point. But really, you talk about the the uh, multi-family units, uh, condition warehouses, office buildings, uh, as an example. So we we are some of our customers are are um, uh, some of the larger malls, say in in Dubai, the Montreal Airport, the Field Museum in Chicago. So kind of give you a, a cross reference. Then I, I just have to come back and mention that you know, that large retailer that everybody would recognize, and I'm sure. You're down in Folsom, uh, off of Bidwell. You'll, you'll be visiting that guy too. So, that that's kind of a, a cross section of a, you know some of our customers and our high value prospects. We consider every customer important, though. So, oh, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Who do you love most? But um, the, it sounds like you you can adapt to a number of building situations. So you know your your technology is broadly applicable you've got growth plans getting into some other areas so uh you know fantastic and we're glad to know that you're uh, local as well because I, I think we have a lot of buildings here that are not that well controlled and uh there, there's probably a good opportunity yeah and, and anything that we can you know learn from our utility partners to help us um you know get into the market for the utilities um since we are a SaaS model um, a lot of utility programs don't quite fit uh, our pricing strategy. Um, however, we've been, you know, working with a couple of utilities, or, or at least around the U.S. Um, right now, on figuring out how they can help 
you know, bring it to their customers or fund partial of it, or maybe there's a little bit of a CapEx improvement that they have to fund and then they can, then the customer pays for our, our services. So we just need to make those connections and, and work with them to, to find the right path to, to market. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So Mark Berman, um, you're a veteran of this industry. You've looked at this sector for decades. Um, you've been an innovator in the area. Uh, what's your impression of, of what these guys have and, and what recommendations would you have for uh, what they would do to implement their growth strategy? Well, thanks, Gary. I appreciate that. Uh, this sounds impressive. There is a lot of data out there that can be used to uh, predict demand for heating, cooling, and ventilation, and it hasn't been utilized. So this sounds like a, uh, a very useful product, uh, particularly in the, in the large commercial space. Uh, you know, if you can tie in with ESG, if you can tie in with generating numbers that help, uh, help companies meet their reporting requirements, I think that would be beneficial. I'm sure you're, you're already thinking about that and working on it. I appreciate that. Yes, the, exactly. So that's been our latest push is the reporting side of it. Since we are collecting so much data already, it wasn't a big uh, development effort to create a automated scope, scope one and scope two re emission reports for our customers via dashboard or, or email. So uh, we're definitely pitching that. And now we're going to go to market to um, even utilize that technology on buildings that aren't quite compatible for our technology as we discuss how to make those buildings compatible um, and build a long-term, you know, uh, let's say CapEx plan to, to bring the technology to their portfolio. So um, Good. definitely thinking about that one. I'd like, like, to, like to turn it back a little bit on that point uh, for a question for Franklin. Can I put you on the spot, Franklin? I guess he's a... It's not listening. Yeah. So we catch up to him later. But in general, my, my question, Franklin. <laughs> okay, I'll put it in chat. He's back now. All right. Well, this has been uh, a very enlightening uh, session for us here, and you can see there's a high level of interest. Um, I, I think you've got a lot of low-hanging fruit here to harvest, Bob. Um, this, this is not an area where there's been a lot of, uh, uh, people coming in and dealing with the buildings in Sacramento yet. We've got old buildings that are being renovated. We've got brand new buildings going in. Um, so I think you got a lot of opportunity here and then we would welcome, uh, more participation from, uh, what you have here and, and getting more brain box, uh, activity. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Absolutely appreciate. It. Let me let me do come back to the question I was going to ask Franklin. I think it's relevant. You know, when we talk about ESG um, objectives and such. It's also a matter of how we're using clean energy versus dirty energy at any given point in time. Right. And I think that's kind of a unique uh, uh, feature that we bring to the market as well in terms of reporting and actually summarizing that kind of data, or peak, uh, if you will, like um, in, in traditional energy management, trying to stay off of peak hours. Right, trying to use energy that's clean at that point in time and delivered from the grid. So I was curious, um, you know, from SMUD what their direction was on that. But um, I'm here. I'm local, as you mentioned. Happy to to meet at any point in time and to make the right connections. You know, I'm part of one one of one facet of the organization, but there's a, a, a tremendous uh, a breadth of bench behind me. So I appreciate the time for everybody today. To thank well, you. I know there's a big question in buildings in our area. Some of the lower buildings, you know, should I invest in storage or not? And you would have the ability to show them what the payback on that would be from, from what could be done, just what they have right now and mm -hmm. what the payback might be from adding something. So lots of uh, directions that I could see you taking to improve the product and add more services. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. So Thomas, uh, back to you for the wrap up. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Gary. Um, just if anyone's curious, also in California, the CEC is working on demand response programs and building communications there. And their resources board is another one that's going to be putting a lot of um, efforts and energy into that. So um, always, you know, keep in contact and look what they're doing on RFPs. And with that, I first want to um, 
thank our guests for joining us today. And that's uh, Blake Standen and Bob Sobzak. Um, very much appreciate. I think it was a good discussion. We'll edit it down a little bit and then continue and then share it out again. Um, thank you to our sponsors, our large ones, and of course, with our overall program sponsors, SMUD, CEC, Blue Tech Valley, and River City Bank. Make sure you check out our virtual event in two days on how to build highly effective teams. And then in two weeks, giving plants a voice and our clean tech meetup about charging. We're trying to, we're going to try to cover all of it in one thing. It's going to be hard, but it should lead to an interesting discussion. Also, I want to thank you all for attending. And if you want to connect with us, we're on Instagram, I think. Um, maybe we're even on TikTok. Who knows? But we're definitely out there on LinkedIn, active, and you can follow and subscribe to us on YouTube. Additionally, you might see this interesting looking one right here. That's Empower Innovation Network. That's um, a LinkedIn-like thing for energy, the energy transition in California. And with that, thank you all for attending and have a good day.